According to Webster's Dictionary, a menagerie is a strange or diverse collection of people or things. In this case, it's a menagerie of birds. Let's see which of these birds are in captivity for cold-blooded murder. Right now, on Love and Murder. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Love and Murder. And you already know what I'm going to say. The weekly true crime podcast discussing relationships gone terribly wrong. And when I say terribly wrong, how wrong do I mean? She means dead wrong. Dead wrong. D-E-D. Not even the A is in there. That's how dead they are. D-E-D wrong. I am your host, Kai. And this lovely woman who just said dead wrong is the amazing, the illustrious, the gorgeous, the half Native American. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. She comes up with something so, I don't know what, every week. (laughs) Hello, everyone. You know, I want to try this. Can I say dead wrong this way? How would this sound? Dead wrong, Kai. Ew, sounds like you're trying to get somebody in the bed. Well, maybe I am. Ew. Okay, I'm taking requests. Anyone interested? You know what? You should... Put my inbox somewhere. Listeners, hear you it. hear that? This is this is sorry. You you can inbox her <laughs> at no conducts radio at gmail dot com. Just make if sure you're cute. just make sure in the subject label it Shar because I, I don't want that kind of fan mail. That's that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, but there's rules. You've got to be really cute. And I don't go for women, so don't try it. Okay, carry on. Now that they know my preferences. Just, okay. <laughs> Cute is relative. So anyways, what you think is cute, I could think is like hideous. So I know it's in the eyes of the beholder. So behold, I don't want ugly. Okay, that's all I need. Again, that's relative. Anyways, (laughs) Anyways, <laughs> we're going off target here. Um, so we're back, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> our show discusses true Hello. crime cases told in the form of a story with mystery, suspense, and just a little bit of humor sprinkled on top. And you already know I got to say it. For those of you with the S on the chest and the S doesn't stand for super, if you don't like, you know, your true crime w- with people laughing on top, you don't like a laugh track when you're listening to stuff about, you know, people getting murdered and stuff. And if you're still with the S on the chest, you know, too stupid to realize we're not laughing at the victims or anything surrounding the victims or that kind of tragedy, then this show is not for you. And I am not hesitating to tell you that you can leave. The door's over there. I'll open it for you. I'll help you out. But if you're cool with us, if you're cool with true crime and you're cool with comedy, I won't even say comedy because we're not comedians. But if you're cool with true crime, if you're cool with, uh, you know, laughing a bit and, you know, getting your panties out of your butt crack, then this is the place for you. Now, with that being said, check out our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. As I always remind you, we're everywhere. Follow us on social media. The links are in the show notes below, but I'll say it at the end of the show, so you can wait till the end of the show if you just want to hear my gorgeous voice saying it. If you want to be part of our LNM exclusive community, then join us over at Patreon at patreon.com forward slash love and murder. Now, when you join you will get commercial free episodes of love and murder because you know right now we have commercials because we got bills to pay you also get bonus episodes every two weeks of crazy crime florida crime our behind the scenes you have a relationship question we got the advice for you and so much more all of this for only how much, Char? $3 a month, the price of a cup of coffee. $3 a, a month. And for you people like me who don't drink coffee, $3 a month, the price of, uh, I don't know, a slice of pizza, I guess. <laughs> no, in what world? I have no idea. I'm just trying to think what's $3 for people who don't drink well, coffee. Well, definitely not a slice of pizza. <laughs> Anyways, so, yep, join us over well, at patreon.com forward slash love and murder. And if you have listened to our show before or even at the end of this episode and you like it, please head on over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can rate now on Spotify and give us five Yay. stars. One, two, three, four, five. And say whatever you want in the description. Say Kai is like jacked up 
She doesn't drink coffee, but she seems like she's jacked up on caffeine yeah, right now. Yeah, something going on. Something. <laughs> but say whatever you want in the description. Lots of chocolate. But it helps bring us up in the charts and helps people find us, just like you found us. It'll help more people find us, and we'll be so, 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 so grateful to you. The easiest way that you can rate us is to go to our website, www.murderandlove.com. That's love and murder backwards, murderandlove.com, and choose rate us right there in the menu above. Why am I always pointing like people are watching me? I'm literally talking to a computer screen with no camera on me, but I'm always pointing like they could see me pointing up and stuff like that. Anyways. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Visuals work. Visuals work for people. They're visualizing. I think that's me. I, I, I definitely think that's me. So now were y'all able to listen to the Knoxville trio case? Cause if you didn't dude, I'm telling you, you got to go back and listen to episodes 43 and 44. Now this case, we kind of did a little bit, a little bit different. We told it in two parts so that we could tell it from the standpoint mm-hmm. of each person's perspective. So yep. the first part, yep. which was episode 43, we told from Erin McLean's perspective. So it was her story, her side of events and everything like that. And then the second half was Eric McLean's side, which was episode 44. So it was his perspective side of the story how he thought everything went down and then at the end of episode 44 we told you exactly what happened so you know how you say you have this side of the story that side of the story and in the middle is the truth so there were certain things that we knew definitely were the truth but then everybody had their yes. side of the story so exactly yeah so those, it's it's just two there's always two sides to every story yeah so y'all yeah. have to listen to that and then the ending was like just really unexpected. So you have to listen to that episode to find out everybody's side of the story, find out who do you think is telling the truth, find out who do you think story was, you know, closest to the truth. And then just what did you think about the ending? So definitely go back and listen to 43 and 44. And after you listen to this episode, of course, I'm not telling you to stop this episode. No, no, no. (laughs) After you listen to this episode, go back and listen to that. And you know, Join us in our group and let us know what you think. Now, coming up next week is the February missing persons cases. And, you know, if you have anyone that you want us to include in our uh, broadcast, please email us at noconductradio at gmail.com or just go to our website, www.murderandlove.com. That's love and murder backwards, murderandlove.com and go to the contact us section. Use that box to send your missing persons and we can include it in our February missing persons report. And I hope everyone has been sharing our January missing persons episode to get the word out. Yes, absolutely share. Basically, all you have to do is hit share and share it to your social media just at least one time matter of fact matter of fact while i'm talking right now go back to your main menu of your listening platform whatever listening platform you're on and hit the share icon it usually looks like like somebody is like the greater than and less than sign it usually looks like that hit that icon on episode number 42 and right now share it to your facebook or your twitter right now i'll give you a couple seconds to do that i'll wait Okay, so you should have shared it, took a couple seconds, now on to our show. Tonight we are talking about the case of Mary Ellen Samuels and Robert Samuels. Mary Ellen Grunick was born on September 3rd, 1947 in Southern California. She had an amazing childhood growing up into, quote, a very pretty teenager. As a teen, she loved going to drive-in movies, old, old, (coughs) excuse me. <clears throat> sure, you like going to drive-in mu- movies? Okay, wait, what was that? Oh, something was in my throat and it was making my cough come out saying old, you know. I'm sorry. Oh, I thought it was I thought it was something issue with drive-in movies like okay, cough cough. Oh, got it. Um wow. I love drive-in. But... <laughs> Well, wow. I do. What's up with drive-in movies? There's some inside joke here. Yeah, I'm no, sure actually, you like drive-in <laughs> movies. <laughs> if I'm even watching the movie. Good God. So can you guys tell I'm this single? Took a you turn. can tell I'm single, right? This took but, a but, turn. But, <laughs> yeah, I'm having flashbacks. But no, you know what's so weird about that is that they're becoming obsolete because a lot of cities and towns have one or less than. And, you know, these days. I want to try a drive-in movie. It seems like a really cool concept. 
If you can find one, that's my point. They're becoming obsolete. You might have one on the, in the average town, but years ago they were popped up everywhere. You know, popped up. That makes no sense. But yeah, anyway, yeah, and it's they're fun. So let's see, let's see what happened at this drive-in movie. Well, nothing there. happened at this drive-in movie. I'm just saying that's what she liked to do as a teenager. She liked to go to drive-in movies. Probably for the same reason Char over there like to go to drive and Wait a minute, when was she when was she born or when like, She was born are, in nineteen forty seven. She is older than you, but still. <laughs> anyway. Very funny, Kai. She is older than you by a couple of years, is that what you're saying? <laughs> but do you get my point? Back then it was extremely popular and they just started dying out, so I, I wanna yeah. I wanna try one out. It sounds sounds like it would be You've fun. never done that? No. Why would I do drive-in movies? Like, I've never really... I think Why would you not? They're still popular. Because I really haven't seen any. You've never been to one is what you mean. I've never had an opportunity to find one to be able to go to one. Every time I hear of something, it's like in a small town, and it's far That's from That's what me. I was saying. That's what I was saying. They're becoming obsolete. There's generally just one, you know, in any particular city or town. Yeah. Well, you find one out there, and you let me know, and be sure to take plenty of snacks. That's the thing to do at drive-ins. You bring all your own good stuff, you know? I mean, drive th- drive-ins suit me fine because of my personality. I can sit there and in my car and watch my movie by myself. I'm good with that. I don't need a Okay, well, here's a, here's a better question. Here's a better question. Can you sit through the second feature because you always get two? Yeah, I used to go movie hopping before I, had a, uh, before I had a kid. I used to go movie hopping all the time. It was oh, a wow. hobby. No. Okay. As long as it's a good movie like not any romance not oh god not romance just what's wrong with romance uh, oh my god the bore factor is not even funny <laughs> no the thing is it's more fun i think if you're to drive in with a with a guy if it's romantic no. otherwise i'm definitely i mean I, I go to movies with guys but uh, action action is my thing action mm. suspense mystery i mean why do you think i came up with love and murder <laughs> Yeah, did yeah. you hear that, listeners? Why did she? Yeah, okay, I don't. Because that's, romance her, is... that's how her mind works. So, see, <laughs> I like romantic comedy. That's about as far into romance as I go. But just okay, like romance, like comedy. the Bridges yeah. of Madison, whatever the f- yeah, county. No, yeah. I don't. No, I don't listen to that. She said whatever. Oh like Titanic. God. Oh my God! You could. I couldn't even that's tell. The best. I couldn't even tell you how long it took me to get through one hour of Titanic, and then I just gave up and fast forward to the to the scene where the boat is capsizing and it breaks. That's the best part of the movie. That's as far as I got in the movie, and I have no idea what happened. So I don't. Okay, you're gonna get some very strange mail, and it's they're gonna be very upset. There's a lot of Titanians. I'm not out saying. There. I mean, obviously, it made a lot of money. They like it. I mean, other people have their 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 likes. You know, people like romance i just don't like romance it's just not for me i'm not knocking it it's just not my cup of tea that's all <laughs> i'm i'm okay. complete action give me fighting like oh give me tsh, explosions like the nice like you know just conflict. why did that horse even explode that's kind of my movie like <laughs> that's what i like okay <laughs> so anyway so she liked driving movies she liked going to disneyland and she was boy crazy which that i can't understand either my friend my daughter has a friend who's boy crazy and it's like every single boy and i'm just like dude seriously but anyways, I, I'm a weird, I was a weird girl. <laughs> like I was just No, but at 14, but at 14, you're supposed to be boy crazy. I wasn't crazy, boy crazy. So I was boy crazy in the fact of, ooh, do you want to go outside and play swords and, and fight ninjas? Let's go. That was me at, at 14. Like I went out <laughs> in the woods with my brothers Tomboy, or my friends yeah. and we played army or we played ninja. We played ninja turtles. I was always Michelangelo. And, you know, that's what I did at 14. So anyways. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> so anyway, she'd often be seen, quote, chasing boys at local dances. Uh, as one of her teenage friends said, quote, when we would go out and meet guys, it was always Mary Ellen they would focus on. So, you know, she's the hot girl. One boy in particular, who was also one of her neighbors, had a crush on her, but was always too shy to say anything. And his name was Robert Samuels. Robert Samuels was born on September 20th, 1948 in Craven County, North Carolina. His family moved to Santa Ana, California, where he grew up and graduated from Santa Ana Valley High School. 
two years after Mary Ellen did. During his youth, he loved photography, and this love for photography continued even as he grew up. This and the fact that he was a diligent, hard worker. This diligence, as with anybody else with this kind of, you know, this forte that they have, this diligence and hard work would pay off for him as he landed his dream job as an assistant cameraman in Hollywood. Wow, that is awesome. I know, right? Yeah. He worked from like being an assistant cameraman <laughs> to being a successful cameraman in no time. And he actually worked on many well-known films such as, and y'all are about to be surprised here, such as mm -hmm. Lethal Weapon 2, Simon and Simon, MASH, The Color Purple, Beverly Hills Cop 2, and so much more. So That's an impressive list. Right? That really is. You can actually wow. check out his IMDb. So if you go to our website and go to this show's notes, I have the link to his IMDb there, and you could actually check out his IMDb to see whatever else he worked on. Now, working as a cameraman and, you know, on these famous movies, the hours were long, as you can imagine, but Bob loved his work. So Bob's living life, making movies, and in the meantime, Mary Ellen had gotten married, had a daughter, and gotten divorced. Then, in 1980, Mary Ellen and Bob saw each other again. This time, though, Bob wasn't going to let her get away. I mean, like... He let her get away the first time. He sees her again. He's like, you know what? I'm a success in Hollywood of all things. I see this yeah. woman. It's not happening again. And, you know, he probably was I'm like. I'm snatching you up this time, yeah, lady. He probably was Come like, on. they saw each other. And you know how you see somebody from high school or from your past or whatever. And you're just mm -hmm. like, oh, Mary Ellen, Bob, how long has it been? About 10 years. Oh, my God. What's been going on? Have you been doing? I don't see a ring on that finger. So how is Mr. <laughs> Mary Ellen? Oh, I'm divorced. Yeah. Oh, no. I'm so how sorry sad. to hear so that. Sorry. Yeah. You know, I'm in town for a little while do you want to get dinner i guarantee you that's how the conversation went <laughs> yeah i pretty much agree it's, yeah exactly <laughs> so you know he wasn't letting her get away so they started dated and he mean he wasn't letting her get away because six months later when he was 32 and she was 34 they got married Look, oh, he learned so his cute. lesson good. He was not making the same mistake as when he was a teenager. He locked that down fast. Quick. Yes. Yeah. Now, after they were married, they purchased a house in Northridge, which is in, in the San Fernando Valley. Now, Bob loved Mary Ellen's daughter, whose name was Nicole, and he adopted her. So now they have a happy family. He got yeah, the girl of his dreams. Happy family. He has the house. Mm -hmm. He has the job of his dreams. And now he even has a daughter. So it was like everything's coming together. Everything's on the up and up for Bob, you know. And, you know, for, for Mary Ellen, you know, you marry some guy who works in Hollywood. He's happy with his job because sometimes you can marry the guy of your dream and he's not happy with his job, which, which actually brings conflict into your marriage. Yes, it does. Yeah. Lots of stress. Mm -hmm. So, but you have this guy who... You know, he doesn't care that you have a kid to the point that he adopted your kid. You know, he has a successful job and it's not only is it su successful, it's a job that he likes and he loves you. You just found out he's loved you since high school. So that means he love loves you. He really yeah, loves you. Yeah. So like even on her side, it sounds like it's on the up and up, right? Mm -hmm. So everything's going great, whatever, whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm loving their life as well. Yeah. Like vicariously. For real. I'm living through it. Like, oh, this is great. This is awesome. But this is. It's just what people dream of, right? Ah, uh, yeah. But also, yeah. this is love and murder. This isn't, you know, honeysuckles and butterflies podcast. So we know something's about to go down. <laughs> We've already learned that a few weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> so as time passed, differences in their personality start coming out. So you know what? Mm. Bob saw, saw her from afar in high school. He probably saw that she was the hot girl, like little waist, big butt. You know what I'm saying? Like, ooh. Exactly. Pretty smile. And he put in his head what he thought she was. You know how you could put somebody on a pedestal, you think they're this, oh, sure. you build them up in your mind, and then you finally get with them, like, oh my God, I've loved you for like you're 20 like, years. Oh, but I don't know you, you're exactly. so weird. Exactly, you're, <laughs> you're not what I had in my head. It, not at all. So mm -hmm. that's what's happening, their personality started coming out, and you know, you see Bob was hardworking, goal-oriented, down-to-earth, and Mary Ellen, 
was the complete polar opposite. Now, if you are not people who are like you started out when you were younger, you knew each other's personality. You actually got to learn more about each other, not just six months and then in. You got to learn more about each other and you're cool with that polar opposite. It works. It does work. Don't get me wrong. It does work. But if you go in and you think this person is one way and from what you think it's the complete opposite, that's when it doesn't work. So yeah, this is what this situation was. So she liked playing. She liked the fast life. She liked the sexy clothes. She liked partying, everything that Bob was not about. And the other thing that Bob was not about that she was totally about was she loved spending money like it was water. Like it was just like, oh, <laughs> hey, it's Tuesday. Make it rain. Woo! It's shopping time again. Let's go back to the mall, y'all. Exactly. So she yeah. liked doing that. And it made them constantly fight about money. Now, oh. after some time, Bob was like, you know, I got to find a way to like calm her down. Just what can I do? So he- Well, he's not going to stop making money as a Hollywood film, a big time film director. No. So that is a problem. Well, he's not a film director, he's a cameraman. Or a cameraman, but the more, excuse me, thank you, but the more that he makes, the more that's available for her to spend. I mean, this is a very likely story with couples that are, Well, and then, so he's trying to figure out how can he get her more goal-oriented, more focused, maybe Mm -hmm. making her own money so that she can feel a sense of purpose and, you know, maybe spend her own money and not just spend up his, all his money. So... Mm -hmm. Back in the day, I guess Subway had just come out. So he bought a Subway sandwich Mm -hmm. franchise and made Mary Ellen the manager. Like I said, I think that he thought if he did this, she would feel like she has her own money. And being that she's managing her restaurant, she might get Mm -hmm. a sense of responsibility. And that was his thought process. But he was wrong. He was so wrong. Was he terribly wrong, Kai? Dead wrong. (laughs) Is he dead wrong? (laughs) So he was so wrong. And the how wrong he was was he came to find out in October nineteen eighty six. He came home from work. I'm just working for my family. Nice day at work. Come home. You know, maybe my wife would be there, I don't know, waiting to say at least hello to me. Instead, he comes home to an empty house and a note on the kitchen countertop from Mary Ellen. He opened the note and read, Dear John. Frick. (laughs) Now, for the young listeners, Dear John, a letter that starts off when somebody says Dear John, it's called a Dear John letter. And it's basically (laughs) basically similar to breaking up with your husband or whoever Mm -hmm. over a text message. Right. That's what it's, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty comparable. So people would take pen to paper and write, Dear John, you're annoying me. Mm-hmm. I can't stand it. But your it face. always starts out as Dear John. It, it, even if his name is Bob, it's always yeah, Dear John. John. <laughs> dear John. <laughs> so I don't understand why people do this. You know, my thing is, why don't you just tell the person, you know, I don't, I don't like you anymore. You're chewing. When I hear you chewing, I want to it's break so the annoying. table in half and yes. beat you in your mouth with it. I cannot. St- then <laughs> you chewing. Wow, did you have a flashback or something? Of course kind not. Of I, don't know. I haven't. <laughs> I, I haven't. I mean, I don't know. It's my brothers. I, I have a brother. I can't stand how he chews. But then I found out that's a that's a not a disorder, but it's a people have this thing where they can't stand hearing chewing, and it's certain. No, chewing. actually, I agree. I feel like that too. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about it's bashing their head in. Chewing. I, I do don't want to bash their head on. in, but it's like my. <laughs> my nerves stand on end and I just have to sit there and like breathe and calm myself down. But I didn't want to bash the head and I was just saying this for the show. Good Lord, Char. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm like, yeah, just tell them you're not interested in them and, you know, go about your business. Like what's going to happen unless you have a reason for doing it. Like you think that if you tell this person to their face, they're going to hit you in the back of the head with a folding chair then I could see not wanting to be in the same room while breaking up with them. So that's the only time I could see that. Other than that, don't be a coward. Just be like, look, I don't like you anymore. You know, I saw this hot dude down the street when I was at the mall and I was like, hey. Uh, Anyways, we're going together and I don't want to be with you. So 
So, Kai, this is interesting because my mom used to always tell me never tell a man to his face that you're leaving him because you never know how he'll react. So that's why when I left my ex, I did it while he was at work. And when he came home from work, all the furniture was cleared out the house. I'm going to say, that? like, literally no offense to your mom. But I know. Your mom has real trust issues. Like, seriously, <laughs> when it comes to guys. I would love to She's delve like, into that psychology. Ever. But, mm. Well, you know what? But sometimes she's proven herself to be right about that because we watch Lifetime I mean, a lot. I mean, a duh. And it but happens again, all the time when you tell them they're, you're leaving. Again, they kill you. Again. Or they attempt it's to. It's if well, you get. I mean, if somebody's going to kill you, there's been like 50 billion red flags before it got to that point. And if you were dumb enough to be with that person, then I mean, <laughs> it's not well, like you know it's okay, not okay, like he I'm just went from being like. Oh, I'm this great guy. I take care of my mother. I take care of blah, blah, blah. And then you're like, you know what? This isn't working out with him. You motherfucker! <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's back up. I Maybe kill is a bit much. I think what, what she meant was, because this is what we see on Lifetime. I think she meant... If you say that to their face, there, there's going to be some retaliation, retaliation in some way. And that's usually what happens. Again, by. no, not necessarily. So the guy's usually like, oh, the like retaliation leaving, from like somebody who is not a crazy pot would more be like they're just talking about you. They're just talking bad about you to everybody who would listen. Now, if you got mm -hmm. with a crazy pot, then, yeah, he's going to try and stab you with a knife or you're not leaving me or if I can't have you, no one can. Like, that's the minority of men, <laughs> people in general. Well, you know what? I'm I'm sticking to that because I don't trust telling them to their face. So every man I've ever left, I've Char, never said it. Well, they had an opportunity to. can have a bonus episode on every guy you've ever <laughs> left and delve into that psyche. But that will be a whole other 60-minute show. show. We mm -hmm. might do it. But it's going to be behind <laughs> Patreon where everybody has to pay to hear this, this train wreck go on. <laughs> so along with my other train wreck stories, you guys go ahead and subscribe now. Quickly, I mean, if y'all want to hear that, let us know. I mean, you might want to hear that. Let us know in the comments. We'll do a whole episode on Char's dating. And that'll be behind Patreon where we can speak freely, but you got to pay to hear it. So I'm gonna let y'all know. Well, actually, actually, we technically do because Shar's crazy life stories. That's pretty much Shar's crazy what I talk life about. stories is not delving into her crazy relationship stories. So I'm gonna tell you again, listeners, don't listen to Shar. <laughs> it's a small minority of men that yeah, who are crazy and who will cut you if you leave them. Again, what I say, if that's the reason you're doing a dare John letter or a text message, totally go for it. That's a mi small minority. Char, okay. Char goes head first, like dive, dive in board head first into that minority of guys. This is Char's life. Well, that's true. That's what I pick. So <laughs> there will be you. 15 good guys standing to the right with roses and <laughs> chocolates. So and I, I would love to make you my queen. And Shara's like, Psh, boy, please. Do you see that train wreck over there? Do you see it? It has the dark cloud and the lightning and it has the signs that says do not enter. That's where I'm going. Yeah. Okay. She's okay. right. Okay. So. Yeah, you <laughs> no argument there. Carry on. <laughs> Let's hear about the rest of their, this train wreck that's happening with this story. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, in her Dear John letter, it had statements like, quote, our marriage had gotten stale. Things just didn't work out. And I hope we can be friends, but I can't live with you. As usual, I searched for the letter, but I couldn't find it online. I really wanted to find it and I really wanted oh, to read it. That's always happens. Yes. Anytime it's something extra juicy that no one else hardly can ever get on their in their forensic shows, Kai will get it. But when it's something else that she absolutely just got to have it, it's not out there. I could not find but, it. I mean, it's it's in it's in it's proven to be out there. I mean, I'm it sure it's actually in court documents, but right. I guess unless but you paid not... for it, they didn't make it available mm -hmm. online. So I couldn't find it. Uh, incredible. Yeah. So anyways, on October 31st, 1986, Mary Ellen filed for divorce. And although she wanted a divorce, Bob wasn't ready to give up on their marriage. So he helped her to get a, an apartment. Some people say apartment. Some people say condo. He helped her get something. 
um, and continued to offer her support. He even paid for Nicole's private school and he continued to support Mary Ellen emotionally and was also her sole form of financial support. Big mistake, but whatever, you know, he paid $1,500 a month in total, which, you know, today only covers rent for maybe a, a one bedroom apartment or, or a studio apartment. But yeah. back then covered everything. That was a lot of money back then. So he was able to, you know, do uh, cover her food, her expenses, yeah, her freaking mm-hmm. rent her daughter's private school. So back then 1500 a month is like what? 10,000 a month now. No, you're exaggerating. That was only 35 years ago. Didn't you say 1986? Yeah. Oh, that's when they got married. Well, Uh, 35 years is a long time, especially when you're talking about inflation. What, what are you talking about? Okay. Okay. (laughs) Okay. That that's fair because it, I mean, times have changed. So prices have definitely increased. Uh, yeah. COVID COVID's Mm -hmm. only been what two years. Have you seen the price hikes in that short amount of time? As we're talking about 35 years here. Homes, gas, I mean, everything. Everything, (laughs) food, food. everything, except, Mm -hmm. of course, pay for workers. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Good Lord. So anyway, so yeah, I think with, I'm I'm thinking about everything 1500 covered. So 1500 back then is kind of like probably 10,000 now, maybe. Okay, but that's not true because my son was born I'm in 1986. I'm thinking about so not, everything no. it covered. Private school. I don't think so. Private school, Shar? How much do you think private school costs? Because I was raised in private school. it's a, It was probably 400 a month back You were then. raised There's in no private way. school in 1932. I thought we were talking private about Private school back then was Where like a dollar a month. Well, where was I getting 1986 from? I'm telling you, I... Char, you were raised in private school in like 1932. <laughs> what? <'Cause> look. what? <laughs> anyway, if this was 35 years ago, that's not going to cover all that. That's all I'm saying. Well, it it's covered it for them. Rent, and he rent was utilities in, and he was in Hollywood. That's what he said. So it covered it for them. That's what he, that's what he actually said, though. That's what they said, yes. That's... Oh, okay. Well, okay. Anyways, Keep in mind, before we make this whole show about arguing about money, anyways, keep in mind that Mary Ellen was still running the subway. So if she was running the subway, I don't understand why he had to give her money. Like, that didn't make sense to me, but whatever. Now, this actually wasn't their first time separating, but this was the longest they've been apart. Now, how long do you ask? Well, this stint was two years long, so... They were apart for two years and actually legally separated for two years. During this separation, Mary Ellen and her daughter, Nicole, started going out to clubs and partying and basically acting like they were rich, you know, and (laughs) they were like fronting the the club bills for their friends. And, you know, guess who paid for all of this? Bob, (laughs) you know, they were just like party like a rock star party and just out there just like acting like you know she was yeah, the movie party star on bob. and bob is just paying for everything and he's just he's just allowing it because to me the first time you did that and i got that ten thousand dollar club bill guess who ain't paying that i guess you have issues i don't know <laughs> i don't know what to tell you guess you owe the club ten thousand dollars but that's just me wow one of her friends is quoted as saying quote one of the things she liked to do was go bar hopping. She would dress up in like sort of her Sunday best, end quote. So she was always, you know, dressing up to go hopping from bar to bar to bar. During this separation, Bob tried everything to get his family back together. But by November of 1988, Bob was only left with depression and knowing that, you know, his relationship with Mary Ellen and her daughter had soured. That's all he was left with. That's so sad. Whereas Mary Ellen was, you know, partying up. Then on the afternoon of December 9th, 1988, police received a 911 call. They were dispatched to Bob's house and was met by Mary Ellen at the door. Like, what the hell are you doing there? Don't you live across the across town in your own condo? Like, why are you here? So she opened the door for them. She wasn't crying. She wasn't hysterical. She was just there. 
and she let them inside like oh come on in you know this is our painting we got in 1985 and yeah this let is, me get you some coffee yeah, would, you, would you like some tea coffee one sugar two milk cream no okay well if you don't want anything um i'm gonna take you over here and then she led them into the house and she just you know here's bob and when they looked they saw bob laying on the floor dead from a shotgun blast to the head a oh, shotgun wow, blast terrible. to the head oh my gosh. she told police Oof. that the reason she was there was that she had stopped by to drop off the dog for the weekend and they'd walked into this scene now any rational person would be like like even if i walked in and it was my ex-husband and for some reason i'm at his house i don't even know why i'd be at his house but i'm at his house and i walked in and I see his head is blown off. So you know there's blood everywhere, brain matter, blah, blah, blah. I would have answered the door freaking the F out. Like frantically, yes, right? like Not just so calm. I would not have been calm. I'd have probably opened the door and they'd have been like, Kai. And I'd have been like, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, I wouldn't just be calm. Like, right on their shoes. Right on their shoes. Like, <laughs> Yeah, that would be me too. <laughs> They're like, don't you run a true crime podcast? Wait a second, how'd you know that? <laughs> yeah, I do, but I've never seen this in real life. Like, oh my god! I know brain brain matter on the carpet Ugh. right here. No, yeah, right. Not it's one happen. thing to talk about it; it's another thing to completely yeah. see it. Anyway, <laughs> upon further investigation, police realized the body wasn't fresh, so this didn't happen today. This actually happened a couple days ago. So they looked around the house and although it did look ransacked and everything, it looked like, you know, somebody was in there upturning tables and pulling out clothes and everything like that. But with their investigation and their keen cop eyes, they saw that this isn't a break in. This looks like an inside job. It doesn't look like somebody kicked in the door and came in here and said, hey, I'm here to rob your house. It didn't look like that at all. So to them, what they're thinking is it was someone he knew, but there was also no real evidence to go off of. However, because of their suspicion, you know, they always look at the wife or the husband first. So they asked yes, Mary they Ellen to come down to the station for questioning. Mary Ellen was like, yeah, sure. I'll be there in about an hour, whatever, whatever. I just have to do my hair and makeup. Dude, you have no clue how right you are. So she came down to the station in this really flirty dress. Like, ooh, look at my curves. Look at this. You know, oh, I'm put in shard of shame. Look at my chest and my butt. Oh, yes. <laughs> and she went down there and she actually began flirting with officers. Hmm. There was even a point where she put her hand and I would never even fathom to do this because if I'm at a police station, even if I'm innocent, I'm freaking nervous. What the hell am I here for? Okay. I'm starting to go through my list of friends. Okay. He wouldn't make any, he wouldn't do anything illegal. Oh crap. He totally would do so. Okay. What did he do? And why am I here? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm nervous. I'm not touching anybody or trying to flirt with anybody, but she had the gumption the balls the cajones to freaking put her hand on one of the detectives head and he was bald so she puts her hand on his hand she's probably like rubbing it with her hands and her her long fingernails and stuff and she starts talking well she did it for good luck and she starts talking because about maybe no she, won't get books, she starts talking about <laughs> how she likes bald guys like you know oh, ah, those bald heads are very so flirtatious. sexy i just love bald guys especially when they have beards like oh you know, like this is her talking to an investigator. So in other words, you're really turning me on, officer. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, that was a moment in Vegas. Sorry, guys. Uh, carry on. Wow. <laughs> I'm just wondering, what do we call that? Like somebody who will be questioning mm. your husband, your ex-husband just died in a brutal, gory manner. You just came down to the to the station to be questioned you're flirting with the investigator. I'm going to tell you what I call that. The audacity. What That's what I call it. Audacity. Yeah, my absolutely. God. So 
After the questioning, there was no evidence that Mary Ellen had anything to do with the death of her husband, so they let her go. Days after Bob's death now, Mary Ellen and Nicole moved back into the house. So they left their condo and moved back into this house days after the death. Dude, how long does it take to clean that stuff up? Is she just well, in the house with a say. splatter of blood uh. on the floor and the walls? Like, what the frick? Doesn't it take a while to clean that up? That's what I would think, unless you'd literally just pull the carpet up from the floor. But she, she was didn't just care. like, you know what? People, Apparently. people, get this carpet up. I don't want to see this. Spray the walls with some bleach. Let's go. Let's go. I don't have time here. I need to move in. Yeah. And it's a free house. We've got to get, get our stuff Good in fast. Lord. You know, we're not going to keep paying on a condo while he's dead. Can you at least pretend to Ugh. care? Maybe just, just a little bit pretend yeah. to care. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, she moved back into the house. Then she put the Subway restaurant up for sale. And she also filed a claim for the life insurance money. And she didn't waste any time on that because they were not divorced as of yet. She inherited everything Bob had worked for in his 20 years of working, which was about five hundred thousand dollars in the insurance and in other assets. And I'm going to break that down for you all later. She, however, didn't even spend money to put a headstone on Bob's grave. It was his friends and his sister who put their money together to get one. So she had all his money and everything like that and didn't even spend money to get him buried. She was like, ah, he's dead already. What does, just throw him in a shallow grave somewhere. Like, how much would that cost? I'll give you, I don't know, $3 for it. <laughs> it wasn't even. Oh, she was a mini pants, Kai. I don't like that. That is just so cold. Yeah. You just and cannot it, it be was this It was his friends and his sister who had to scrounge That's together their shame. money to take mm -hmm. care of him. So while all this is going on, police are still investigating Bob's death because in their opinion, or I don't want to say opinion, in their investigative knowledge, they do not think that, you know, this was an accidental murder. They think this was a total, someone he knew did it. So they're still investigating. They went and questioned his friends and everything. And that's when the, they learned that he was planning to finalize his divorce from Mary Ellen. So like I said, oh. you know, like I said before, he was all depressed and everything like that. And he just realized that the only thing he's getting from this deal is that his marriage and his relationship with his uh, adopted daughter had soured. So that's all he saw. So he had realized you know, that him and Mary Ellen were never getting back together. So back together, right. It's just, there's no hope. Yeah. On October, th on October mm -hmm. 31st, 1998, he met with his lawyer and was working on cutting off her financial support. Now, Bob wanted to be the one who ran that Subway restaurant because at that time he was actually unemployed and he felt like he was the better person to run the restaurant. With the financial support, he wanted to reduce the spousal payments now to well below the $1,200 a month because now that he's unemployed, of course, he can't afford it. So he filed the paperwork and everything like that. But at the time of his death, the paperwork wasn't completed because he was still waiting on his lawyer to complete, you know, their half of the paperwork. So it still was he still was just legally separated from her. He wasn't actually divorced. Police also continued observing Mary Ellen's actions. Some of these actions included her buying her and her daughter fur coats, high-end clothes, buying her new boyfriend. Dude, he's not even cold in the ground yet. Buying her new boyfriend a $50,000 Porsche. She was also making plans to move to Cancun, Mexico by buying a $180,000 condo down there. She also <laughs> continuously wow. took vacations. And my thing is vacations from what? Usually when you take a vacation is from working, but she was just taking vacations. <laughs> just to take vacations. Mm -hmm. And she was still club hopping. And this time, though, going to clubs in rented limos and wearing custom outfits from this West Hollywood store called the Trashy Lingerie, which I looked it up. They're still open. <laughs> that's really yeah. a place what do you know yeah the trashy lingerie so basically she was blowing through the money she'd inherited that's what she was doing now even though you know they kept investigating everything and they had their suspicions 
you can't do anything based on suspicions. Suspicions is an evidence, you know? Suspicions can't be taken to court and say, hey, I think this happened. Put this person in jail. Yeah. So there... I just get this feeling, right. you know, you can't do yeah, that. Yeah, so mm-hmm. there was still no evidence to move forward with an arrest, so they just kept investigating. However, on May 1st, 1989, they received an anonymous tip or... Anonymous, as Shar says, they received an anonymous tip (laughs) and the tipster told them to speak with one of Nicole's boyfriends. And this guy's name was James Bernstein, who is described as a cocaine dealer and as a wannabe wise guy. Jim, as they call him, was 27 and had asked Nicole to marry him. So by this time, it's a 27-year-old Jim. He's actually Nicole's fiance, And, you know, this anonymous tipster was like, hey, you might want to talk to Jim. Police also found out from Mary Ellen's bar friends that she had been actively trying to hire a hitman to kill Bob. Officer John Barrier is the officer who received the anonymous call and he took action. On May 16th, they obtained a search warrant for Jim's apartment and Bob's house. They also scooped up Jim and Mary Ellen and brought them down to the station for questioning. At first, they had them in separate rooms and Mary Ellen had the same calm and flirty demeanor that she did, like, you know, when they had her down there before. And she denied having any involvement in Bob's murder. Jim, however was rattled and after some time they ended up putting them in the same room together and they left them for a little while now what some people don't understand is that when police put you in a room they're still recording you and they're still watching you while you're think while you think you're alone that's a strategy that they use yeah and it works so Mm -hmm. police were able to record jim telling mary ellen quote He's going to arrest one of us or both of us right here, right now, tonight for the murder. (laughs) He says he knows 100% that you and I did this. End quote. Oh, God. (laughs) Dude, I'm telling you. America's dumbest criminals. It only gets a little more stupider from here out. Again, y'all have to watch 90 Day Fiance to know why I said that. (laughs) A little more stupider. A little bit more stupider. Um. It, it, it gets worse, Char. Wait, oh, wait. When I tell, when I go down this case, you're going to be like pulling your hair out by the end. <laughs> <laughs> so police left them alone for a bit longer, then went in to speak with them, but they never got a confession, so they let them go. In June of 1989, you know what? Before I gave you a, my freaking dyslexia, I apologize, people. I gave you a a, a date before um, when... uh, What, of 1996? 1998, when he filed for divorce. Well, you said 98. I said 98. I meant 89. 88. 89. Yeah, I'm sorry, y'all. But we kind of knew it wasn't 98. I was like, okay, there's no way that they were separated 12, 13 years. Yeah, So we kind of figured it out. So I apologize. (laughs) Thanks for the correction. I I flipped it around. So anyways... um, so, so, so in June of 1989, a couple was walking along a remote mountain road in Ventura County and came across a badly decomposed body. Police were dispatched and they realized the body was too badly decomposed to identify it on the spot. So they took it in. Coroner's report later revealed, though, through fingerprints, that the body belonged to none other than Jim Bernstein. Police questioned those close to Jim to find out what happened. Jim's boss, Matt Rao, said that he had been planning on coming to the police and confessing his role in the murder of Robert Samuel. According to Matt, quote, he called me up and said, I'm just going to tell the police what I know. And that's the last time I talked to him. So now cops have a second murder investigation going on. During this investigation, they found a check for $1,500 that led them to two people, Paul Gall and Daryl Ray Edwards. K 
Can you imagine your name rhymes? Hey, what's up? My name's Paul Gall. <laughs> I would never just call myself one name. I would always, hey, yo, Paul Gall in the house. I say Paul Gall in the yeah. house. <laughs> I would just, yeah, the two, it just runs together perfectly. <laughs> it's Paul Gall, yeah, y'all. Yeah, it's Paul Gall, y'all. What's up? <laughs> Paul Gall, y'all. I would have, like, glasses that says Paul Gall, y'all. <laughs> yeah, and I'd have a T-shirt. That's kind of cool. Paul Gall, y'all. Can I see your ID, mister? Ha <laughs> ha. Glad you asked. It's Mr. Paul Gall, y'all. <laughs> anyway, police brought them down. To... I thought you said we weren't comedians. That was pretty funny, though. Well, you also know what comedians don't do? Point out when something's funny. Hence, clearly, thanks, Char, we're not comedians. Ugh. Well, okay. Lord. Can you imagine, uh, <laughs> what's his name? Dave Chappelle on stage. And like he tells a joke, like, yeah, why did the chicken cross the road? Ha ha ha, to get to the other side. See the joke there? And then he, and then he explains it. That's funny. Goes, <laughs> you, know, the, you know what's funny? Then you have to explain it. And it's like, okay, you just killed it. That's not funny. Yes. Comedians sure. never do that. Exactly you know what? what you no, just but did. Actually, <laughs> Good God. I have a little secret. I have a little secret. I actually am a comedian professionally back in the day in New yeah. York. I actually had a. No, literally, seriously, I had a sketch comedy group um, that like a, a routine in New York and we were booked all over. And one of the directors of, of All My Children actually saw my script when I was auditioning. And he's like, I left it on the table when I went to the bathroom. He goes, this is hella funny. Who wrote this? And I'm looking around like me, you know, I, mean, I was really good. I just didn't pursue it any further. So actually, yeah, I'm professionally funny. You guys heard it here first. Char. Okay. With all the Radio crickets. Shut up. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> Good, oh my God. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> listeners, back to the show. So <laughs> they found Paul Gall and Daryl Ray Edwards, and police brought them down to the station with a quickness because this was the first real lead they had gotten. The last time they thought they were going to get something, Jim turned up dead. So this time, they were like, get him! Go! Go! Why is everyone still standing around? Put the freaking donuts down and go! Move! And they went and got Paul Gall and Daryl Ray Edwards. So this time, when they got their people, they sat them in their room, and they questioned to the two men. Paul Gall, y'all, sang like a bird! He sang like a bird. Paul Gall told police everything. Like, this is not the person you want doing criminal invest criminal stuff for you. Like, if you know this person can't keep a secret, he is not the person that you bring into yeah, your criminal. Carry out the murder. Yeah, like, what the? Yeah, you don't do that. Maybe they didn't pay him enough. Maybe she was cheap. I don't know? know. She's like, I'll give you $10. It was like. They had them, they had Paul sitting on the left and Daryl sitting on the right. And they were mm -hmm. sitting there and Daryl's just sitting there with his hand behind his head. And Paul was like, ah, oh. and so they walked in the room. I'm going to tell everything. I'm going to tell Police it Police walked in the room and you know how they, they, they throw down the folder, the manila folder. They were just like, mm -hmm. and he put his hand on his desk and he leaned forward a little bit. And Dal is just like, Psh, you ain't got, you ain't got nothing, Copper. You ain't got nothing. And Paul was like, so they leaned in a little bit. And Paul was like, I'll tell you everything. I'm Paul Gall, y'all. And I have a story to tell. I did it. He did it. She did it. They all did it. Ah! <laughs> Paul couldn't even. Oh, wow. He couldn't even. That was so dramatic. <laughs> it's it probably went down like that because that's that's what criminals do. They sing. You pay once they spend that money, they're telling it all. I mean, that's you know, yeah, typical story. He was singing. I'll even sing it for you. He even admitted that him and Daryl were hired to kill Jim to keep him quiet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, listeners. After your ears are finished bleeding. <laughs> I know. 
So anyway, he even admitted that him and Daryl were hired to kill Jim to keep him quiet. So on June 27th, 1989, they'd murdered Jim by strangling him and then dumping his body on a remote r- road. So police asked them to name this Don, this this mastermind of the criminal world who, you know, put a hit out on someone to keep them quiet. And they were like, oh, it's, it's not a Don. It's just a regular suburban housewife. Mary Ellen. <laughs> exactly. Well, she'd actually paid them $5,000 for the hit. This was the break the detectives needed. Detectives arrested Mary Ellen with a swiftness. When they searched her home, they found a picture of Mary Ellen that was taken by her new boyfriend. Good Lord. She's going through boyfriends like she goes through money. But anyway, They found a picture of Mary Ellen that was taken by her new boyfriend while they were in Cancun. It was a picture of her naked with her private parts covered in $20,000. And the $20,000 was split up in $100 bills. And she had this big smile on her face. Now, as you know... (laughs) <laughs> our Ellen Emmers, we won't let you down. Oh, we're going to put this I was picture. I a visual. That's funny. We're going to put this picture oh. in our Facebook fan mm-hmm. group. So if you search for love and murder fan page or fan group, you're going to find it. Search, you can search Google. You can search Facebook. You're going to find love and murder fan page. Just search it. You'll find it. Ask to join. You'll get in. You'll see the picture. And this here. This little thing here is what police like to call. It's just a little, you know, phrase police like to call evidence of motive. (laughs) So like I said, they arrested her and they charged her with two counts of murder, soliciting murder, conspiracy, and a single count of attempted murder. Now, during the investigation, this is when the whole story comes out. So let's get into that. This is when, Shar, you're about to start pulling your hair out because you're going to be like, what the, what the? So it all started in 1987 when Mary Ellen goes up to every and anyone she can find asking them to help her kill her husband. Hey, you, you want to kill somebody? No, okay, never mind. Hey, over there, you want to kill somebody? Ugh. Never mind. (laughs) So she just is going up to anybody asking her, asking them for help to kill her husband. Her former friend Ann Hambly said that, quote, after several attempts to find someone to kill Robert Samuel had failed, Mary Ellen was able to get James Bernstein to agree to commit the murder. End quote. Nicole had told Jim that Bob had abused her, that he had molested her as a child, and this angered him. A month before the murder, Jim had said that he wanted Bob, quote, taken care of permanently, end quote. So he, like everyone else we report on, went and asked people for help to commit murder. Again, I ask, what is wrong with people? (sighs) Jim went and asked his boss, Charles Mandel, if he knew anyone who could, quote, take care of it. I mean, I know if I was going to go do something illegal, the first person I'm going to go ask is my boss. Is my boss? Like, what? Like, (laughs) really? Anyway, Charles actually gave Jim a number to a guy named Mike Silva and said he could help. Like, honestly, full disclosure here, if I ask my boss and he gave me a number, the trust stops there. Like, I 100% (laughs) automatically think that he's just giving me a cop number and now I'm going to be like, (laughs) yeah, I was just playing, man. (laughs) I'm not about to murder anyone. You were, you were just playing too, right? Right? (laughs) Yeah, that'd be me. But anyways, I mean, that's just me, I guess. Everybody else is different. Anyway, in November and December, in November, yeah. In November and December of 1988, Jim asked another friend, this one owned a gun shop, if he could get some guns. Like, so here's the scenario. Yeah, man, I I know you own a gun shop. I know you need to keep your credentials legit to own this gun shop to, you know, feed yourself and your family and everything. But, and hear me out here, 
So look, I need to kill someone. You have guns. Can I borrow a gun? I have it back in like two weeks. <laughs> I pinky, pinky promise. Wait, wait, wait. You're worried about the condition of it coming back to you? No, 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 man. I'm not an idiot. <laughs> I'll wipe my fingerprints off before I bring it back. Clearly. <laughs> oh, my God. What the, what the? So let me ask you something. He literally tells the owner of the gun, sh the gun, gun shop owner, I want to kill someone with one of these guns, but I'll be sure to wipe off my fingerprints. Well, obviously that Where part of that, that whole scenario I just made up for the show, but yeah, he did. See, he did, he, he did ask him to borrow a gun though. So I, I did. Oh, I get it. Okay. He didn't say to kill someone, but you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if he <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised, wouldn't be surprised if surprised. that whole conversation if that actually whole scenario happened. was exactly what the hell went down. Yeah. <laughs> so Mary Ellen's trial started on April of 1994. And yes, this time is 1994. Now it's the 90s, guys. Now we're on the calendar. I don't think it's 49. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's 94. <laughs> Both Paul, <laughs> Paul Gall and Daryl testified against her because of a plea deal that they they took. And under the mm. plea agreements, they were both spared the death penalty and both received 15 years to life in state prison. In court, Mary Ellen was portrayed as cold, money hungry and a calculated woman. Basically how she came off when they opened the door just to say, hey, we're here for a 911 call. But anyway, that's my opinion. Whatever. Mary Ellen's former friend and testified against her. Dude. I'm going to let you know right now. You commit a murder. You told me about it. I'm singing like a bird. I'm going to tell everything. So I'm not the one. Just keep it away from me. <laughs> she said that she went to the house on the night that Bob was found dead and that she thought to herself that, quote, I couldn't believe that it had finally happened, end quote. She also said that Mary Ellen had given Jim money to arrange the hit six months before the murder and that after it was done mary ellen was scared of getting caught she said mary ellen was very paranoid and was afraid to speak because she thought that the police had her bugged bugs in her purse bugs in her car bugs in her house she thought they just had bugs everywhere bugs up her butt she thought they just had bugs everywhere and also told them that when she asked mary ellen who was mike silva she told her that Mike was hired by Jim to kill Bob. What? I would have just uh, been like, I don't know. I just heard that name. Jim was talking about him. That's all I know. Yeah, I exactly. wouldn't be like, no, yeah, just tell it all. Yeah, right. Oh, God, the prosecution showed evidence that Mary Ellen collected on several insurance policy totaling approximately $240,000. They also showed that the Subway restaurant had been sold in the early 1989s and Mary Ellen had profited about $70,000 from that. They also showed that she received about $6,000 in uncashed payroll checks and she refinanced the house and received $160,000 from that and she kept his car. As we know, just like Mary Ellen, she then started living like a rock star. This is why police were documenting everything she was doing. Like when I, when I saw they were documenting everything, I didn't put two and two together. Like they was like, okay, this is going to show up in court. I didn't even think about that, but that's why they were following everything she was doing. Cause they were going to bring all of this and break down. Yeah, the Cause money. it's against her character. It's, it's a character thing. Oh wow. See, I didn't you even know? realize yeah. I didn't put those together. Anyway, yeah. she also made incriminating statements to certain people. So, like, for someone who was paranoid, she sure was loose-lipped. Good Lord. Anyway, <laughs> remember what she told Anne? Well, she also told another friend, Marsha Hutchinson, that if she wasn't careful in her divorce, then Marsha's husband might put a hit out on her. Which, I mean, to me, that's not evidence, but I guess if you're in a murder trial for putting a hit out, then I guess that would be kind of evidence, huh? No, maybe she was. Why would she tell her friend that? I mean, I'm confused. Paranoia. I don't get it. I mean, she, she just tell... told her friend, like, if you're not careful, your husband might put out a hit on you. I don't know why she would say that. Maybe well, she thought why? it was a you joke. Know why? Because guilty people know because guilty people 
that's the way they think. She's just being, you know, that's that that's what I mean. That's what guilt does. It makes you say stupid things like that because you did something like that, possibly, you know, <laughs> like we don't know for sure if she did it yet. But it's like it it's pointing that direction to even say something like that to your friend. Only a, only a guilty person who would have a criminal mind would say something like that to their friend. There was no need for that. You know, so now you have your friend walking around paranoid. It's crazy. <laughs> just unnecessary. <laughs> and I wouldn't even be paranoid against my husband. I'd be paranoid against you. Like, why would you say something like that? Well, yeah, that exactly. too. Exactly. So Jim also told his boss that Bob had been taken care of and that he'd gotten money from Mary Ellen to pay Mike. They're just telling everybody. They're just singing on each, just singing on one another. Oh my she God. also told Anne that she wanted Jim killed because she felt like he was cracking and he might go and confess to the police. Anne told the court that in March of in March or April of 1989, she introduced Mary Ellen to Paul Gall, who was her boyfriend at the time. Anne introduced him because she thought he could help Mary Ellen with Jim. What? <laughs> After this, Mary, I, how does she keep up with all Dude, this? It's so I, I confusing. I, it's like. I don't know. <laughs> After this, Mary Ellen and Paul had several conversation about Bob's death. In their first conversation, Mary Ellen told him that she'd gotten insurance money due to Bob's death and that Jim was blackmailing her. In another conversation, Mary Ellen again told Paul what she'd told him before and added that she wanted Bob killed because he'd abused Nicole and that she wanted insurance money. In a third conversation, this girl is just talking her ass off. Like, <laughs> good Lord. Yeah. Anyways, in her third conversation, I just don't understand. You should just go turn yourself into cops. Like, I don't understand how Yeah, people... or put a muzzle on You're it, You're just Mary. talking to everyone. Just <laughs> go Just go turn much. yourself in. Like, yeah. <laughs> she doesn't even yeah. know this, this guy, and she's just, like, singing like a bird all over the place. I don't even know why she was even worried about a bug. Like you, you, you have bugs walking right. around all you over the place, the bug. right? She is the bug. Uh, like <laughs> anyway, in the third conversation, oh. she told Paul about a failed attempt to kill Bob. But then when the murder was handled, it was done terribly. And she was surprised that it happened in their house. She was also annoyed that it got blood everywhere. Like, listen to this cold ass such and such. Like, are you serious? Ugh. Anyways. That's my Persian carpet. Yeah, you right. Man. <laughs> the the what do you call that? The wallpaper. Oh, you couldn't just find a better way to die. Like, are you serious? Anyways, right. She also reiterated to Paul that she wanted Jim taken care of because of the blackmail, and she added J that Jim was selling drugs to children. So she's just adding stuff to stuff to stuff like <laughs> by the way you know this <laughs> happened and oh yeah this happened and let's just add and he gave me pancakes with you know uh i don't know cocaine in it or something she's just adding stuff anyway she added that jim was selling drugs to children um i like how i'm just hearing like just little nuggets added in about jim and bob like to get people riled up i don't know if y'all noticed that before uh, I'll get into it again yeah. later and you'll see what I'm talking about. But if you pay attention, she's just adding her and her daughter are adding little nuggets here and there to get people riled up. But anyway, so anyways. Well, well Kai, what I'm curious about is she had the, you know how they say take the money and run. She had the money. She said she had plans to move to Mexico. So why does she even stick around in the States to, to be this stupid, you know, to just tell all of her business and tell everything I, didn't she say she was going to Mexico? You know how some people Does just make sense? need drama surrounding them. They just like need yeah. it. I think this is her. They thrive. I think this is her. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, Mary Ellen told Mike that she would pay someone to take Jim out. In testimony, it was shown that she spoke with Paul about five to ten times and discussed payment for killing Jim about two to four times. Good Lord. And she, she just met this dude. By the way, now, before the murder, Mary Ellen called Paul and told him that she was going to Cancun. While she was gone, she wanted Jim taken care of. Damn, that's cold AF. Well, I did say she would go to Mexico, but she's, she's still 
doesn't make any sense though. I guess she was just going for vacation. I mean, usually but... when I go on vacation, I just ask people to watch my pets, you know. I That's... know. Yeah, yeah. Look, can you can you water yeah, my plants? Can you, watch can you my make cats sure the and... litter box is empty, <laughs> take them out, you know, like I'm going to go <laughs> commit a murder and then I'll, I'll be, be back. <laughs> <laughs> she agreed to pay him $5,000 or she would forgive a loan that she'd given to Anne. Like, you know, you could choose whichever one. You can kill him, I'll pay you five Gs, or, you know, Anne has a loan under me, I'll forgive that if you, you know, take we'll it We'll just out. forget about it. Good Lord. <laughs> so Paul accepted <laughs> because, as he said, his brother had been killed by drug dealers, and he won't have another kid losing his life to drugs. Just a very, very noble guy. So anyway, he accepted, right. and what do you think he did? Well, true to the theme of this case, he called someone else and asked them to help him kill Jim. The person he called was Daryl <laughs> Edwards. Oh, oh, Daryl said he'd take the five G's and help him. You know what? One day, I just might call my best friend just to see his reaction. Like, you know, ring, ring. Hey, dude, I want to kill someone. But listen, before you say no, I need your help. You in? I think the cops would be at my door before I even hung up the phone. <laughs> of course, of course. But you know what? But see, these people didn't think of the fact that the more people that you bring in to the situation, the more that are going to sing and they're going to talk. They're going to tell everything. I mean, that is so stupid. Don't oh, call me and ask me to help you do anything illegal. Because if the cops show up at your house, more than likely I told. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> not going to jail in, for y'all. I turned you in. I'm not even going to keep it a I'm secret. I'm not going I to did. jail for y'all. <laughs> I am not. It's just, I, I don't know. The only thing I could see is there was, like, you accidentally did something. Like, I don't know. I knew, and you need a cover I knew up, your a cover husband up, uh, or whatever was, like, abusive, and you finally stood mm -hmm. up and defended yourself, and it was an accident. I could see stuff like that. But just, hey, I wanted some money and I'm killing this person. I'm going to tell you I killed him. Or, nah, I'm not the one because I will, I will give you up. You know my slogan, sing like a bird. I will be singing. Look. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, in June of 1989, Jim moved in with Ann and Paul because Mary Ann asked him to. Now, let's go back a bit and talk about another testimony le leading up to Jim's death. Dave Navarro testified that Jim, that he met Jim in February of 1989 through Nicole Samuels, who was a friend of David's girlfriend. Ugh. I just have a question here. How many people are involved in this freaking case? This is the right. largest network of bullshit I have ever just read on. And if you flunked math in high school, listeners, you will never be able to add oh, all this Lord. up. It's just like I was, I'm just surprised with all these people in the mix that Mary Ellen was free for involved. this long. Mm -hmm. oh. Anyway, David and Jim became friends and started selling drugs together. One day when Jim and David were hanging out, Jim got a page. Now, kids, Char is going to explain to you what a page is. Okay, so like back in the day when I was a youngin, <laughs> <laughs> it was the coolest thing in the world to have a pager. So what you do is it sits on your hip. It looks like a little square box. And if you really want to look like you're all that, you'll actually tell someone to call you so that you look important. Or you can page yourself. But either way, when you get a page, it's like, oh, my, excuse me, everyone. Oh, I'm flashing because it actually flashes red and green. And, oh, I'm lighting up. But you look at that. I got a page. Would you excuse me for just a moment? And everyone is so amazed because that's just what it was. It was a big deal. Yeah, but you haven't explained. <laughs> you got a page. And what do you do with the page? Oh, oh OK. So, OK, you you look when you you get your page. It actually has the message to that it tickers across or it actually goes across the pager. Um, it, either a telephone number is how it used to start out. And then as time progressed, you know, a technology progressed, then it would actually be a message like, Hey, this is your side piece. Call me now. You know, something like that. Or, Oh, it, it's your, it's your husband. Um, honey, can you pick up some bread on the way I home? I have a question. Or 
How many times yeah. did you text somebody, this is your side piece, call me now? Um, I don't know. Do people do that? I'm pretty sure they do, Kai. I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm just sure asking because that's one but of the first things you said, you this is your side that. piece, call me now. So I'm like, how many times did you do that, Char? <laughs> <laughs> Plenty. That's all you need to know is plenty. Mm. But yeah, anyway, guys, so those were popular back then. That was the way we communicated before, you know, cell phones came out back in the day. Oh, there you have a little a little so history. So that is what a page is, people. So, yes. as Shara said, when you got the page, you got the number and it just flashed across the screen. So when he got the page, he called the number and then left to meet Mike, who he refers to as, quote, the hitman. So he's just running around like, hey, yo, I got to go meet the hitman. I'll be back. You going to have those drugs here when I come back? <laughs> yeah, that 12-year-old right there, you could tell he's itching for a cocaine hit. So make sure you hit that little 12-year-old up right there. And then right across the street is a kindergarten. Go over there. And after I finish meeting with the hitman, I don't know if anybody heard me. I'm going to go meet with the hitman. The hitman. I'll be right back to sell more drugs. <laughs> oh, There's just so much evidence. It's just, inc- this is like the messiest oh, case ever. God. <laughs> it's just a big, no, no pun intended, but it's just a big bloody mess. No one has any, any thought process of like, any common sense, no order, no structure, just helter skelter. And then, of course, he really did sell drugs to kids. So, for you listeners out there, she wasn't making that up. That's in the transcript. I mean, it's not. I just said that. I mean, they said he was. No, he did sell drugs to kids, though. That's what she said. She said that. She said that. But she, she says the, a bunch well, of that's shit. That's what she told the cops. That's though. what she said. Well, that's not what she told the cops. She told somebody else that to rile him up to want to kill Jim, and then their testimony revealed what she said. She said that. Okay, well, still, it was part of her testimony, even if it wasn't true. That's what she said. I mean, yeah, but you can't just go by. It was part of her testimony, so he must have done it. Like, the hell? <laughs> like, I just go to trial. Well, our, our scenario is based on their idiocy. That's all it is. So anyways, on May 1st, 1989, remember that date. Do y'all remember that date? That's when police received an anonymous call, an anonymous, an anonymous call from a tipster. Now we know that tipster was David. So David, who was Jim's friend, who was AKA akin to Kai, because you, oh, you going to go find a hitman? Oh, I, I have a phone call to make. No, no reason. No reason. I'll be back. I just have a phone call to make <laughs> so anyway david called the police and he gave them the names of mary ellen samuel and jim bernstein he also gave them the number to the page that came in like good god you even let him see the number dude you're like yeah i'm gonna go see the hitman oh, look wow. at the number right here hitman hit man this is the number hitman <laughs> like what the hell these people are just and he probably had it labeled yeah, that hit way. <laughs> In his phone, it just said hit <laughs> Oh, my God. The police, are going, the police are going, oh, we're going to have lots of donuts in the office today for celebration. He said, I wonder which number to call. Oh, number one is labeled Hitman. Just hit one. You'll get the Hitman. Yes, yes. Good yep, Lord. There you go. The trial also included testimony about intense and very vivid love letters male strippers, cocaine use, botched murder schemes, mother-daughter cheesecake photos. Like, wait, 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 wait. We can't, we cannot oh, gloss over that. You can't what be the F is yeah. mother-daughter uh, cheesecake photos? What the, what the? Is it them eating cheesecake or are they layered in a cheesecake? Not so or? innocent. Not so innocent. Kai. Wait, what, what is a cheesecake photo? Are you really seriously I'm asking? I'm dead Do I serious. Have to go back in what time is a cheesecake again? photo? Oh, here we go. This is Char's going back in time history. We were doing a rewind. So that actually wasn't my time. That started in the 30s and 40s with pinups. But cheesecake literally means nude. Ew! It means nude. Ew! Yeah. No. Yeah. Hell no. Fuck no, not with my mom. Well, no, 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 not that you can't eat cheesecake while you're nude, but it, t- it typically meant nude not toast. with my mother. No, no. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> yeah, that's what I no. said. Ugh, so gross. So inappropriate. That's so disgusting. Well, wait a minute, but they party together. 
right? Got drunk. I mean, together, I guess, but that's taking it to a whole other level. I'm taking together. nude photos with yeah. my mom trying to look oh sexy. Oh, eat. Oh, <laughs> I know it's like barf again. So see, I could barf at the star, door. I could see, not that I sit there and think about you having sex, but I could see, okay, Char has sex. I'm cool with it. Char has sex. She's No, wait, let's not exaggerate. It's been a while. But okay, but whatever. Anyway. You know, she's freaky. <laughs> she has sex, blah, 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 blah. Then I turn to my mom and you're just like, take that same thought process and attach it to your mom. And no, let me tell you how many times my mom possibly, we're not even confirming it here, possibly had sex. She has four children. So exactly four times in her life, she went into a room with a briefcase and she was dressed like a businesswoman, right? She sat down, she opened a briefcase, there was a contract. They signed the contract. And then as vanilla and missionary as you could possibly think of that you don't even want to think of, she engaged in the biological act of procreation and in that one time, she had me. And then the next time she did it was how many years later? She had my brother, and then my other brother, and then my last brother. And that's it. She closed up shop. And that is the story of how we were born. That's it. Okay, that doesn't mean we don't know if it was vanilla. It was time, completely if, even 100. It was even more bland than vanilla. It was like... How do you it was know like that? you Did cooked your dinner you? without salt. It was just water. And you just cooked <laughs> your dinner in just boiling water. No kind of seasoning at all. And then you put it on a white plate. And it was just white rice with white chicken. And no color to it at all. And then you sat there in a white room eating with a white fork. And like literally that. Okay, so what you're saying, like white on, ri white on rice, a glass of milk. A glass of milk in a snowstorm, right? You've heard that before? Uh, yeah, I guess. It was like <laughs> just the most basic, bland, blah, anything you could think of. And that is the story of how me and my brothers were born. And that's it. And my mom never had sex okay. again. And that was it. And it was like she got, she got the idea of having us from a biology book. So she followed the biology to a T, you know, and that was it. And that's how we were born. Okay, so listeners, please don't believe that Completely story. Completely believe that story because vanilla. my mom doesn't have no. sex. So anyways. Well, that's what we all want That's believe. what happens anyway, with my point. mother. I don't know what y'all's parents do, but my mother, she doesn't have sex. And that's it. So with that being said, I couldn't then take that thought process and then have a what they're calling a cheesecake photo with my mom because... I, what, what are you doing, old woman? What do you put your clothes on? No, I'm young. I can do this. You put your clothes on and go sit in the corner and read a book of War and Peace. Go now. That yeah, but Kai, you know these days there's a lot of moms that have hotter bodies than the younger ones. And, and I don't do care. Have your hot body. I had people in my high school who thought my mom was my sister, and they were trying to holler at her. And I, you look, there were so many almost fights that happened. So look. Be hot, look young, do whatever you want. And again, that's y'all's mother. My mother, on the other hand, she doesn't do any of that. She dresses in button-up shirts, <laughs> which she literally does. And she wears purses where you have to, like, you put the purses, the purse in the crook of your arm. And so she has to hold her arm up. And then she sashays around. And that is my mother. I can't speak on y'all's mother. Thank you. Now, Very now interesting. we're moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so now that I know what cheesecake photos are, I'm really grossed out. I seriously, I didn't know what it was. I didn't understand what that was at all. But anyway, so they had mother daughter cheesecake photos and a talking parrot. <laughs> a talking parrot that cursed out the cops. <laughs> this this <laughs> I like that. This 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 whole thing is a circus. I just I mean, why stop there? Why don't we just keep going? Yeah, they had a stop? bear, why, a tiger, a guy who had three syringes full of drugs in his butthole that when the cops found it, he said it wasn't his. Like, really, that was a true story, which left me with so many questions. It wasn't mine, but it's in my okay. <laughs> So many questions. I just had that a That was a 100% okay. true story. But anyways, 
For those of you who aren't multilingual and don't speak my native tongue of sarcasm, those last ones were not actually on the trial. So, you know, the S on the chest is people. You kind of got to spell it out to them because anyways, now remember that picture of Mary Ellen with the $20,000 and money on her naked body. This was also shown in evidence and was described at the, as, quote, the most eye-catching piece of evidence. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> as if this was not enough, like, already going on, Nicole's daughter decided to testify to the objection of her lawyer. I mean, he only went to law school, and as we can see, everyone involved in this case had made all the right moves so far, so what could be wrong with Nicole taking the stand even though her lawyer says not to? So her testimony was the same thing she told Jim. Before we continue, I want to say two things. Number one, trigger alert. Sexual assault allegations are ahead. So if you want to skip forward a minute or something, you can. If you just want to turn it off here, which I don't suggest you turn it off because then you won't find out the end. But I understand sexual assault allegations are ahead, so that is my trigger alert. You might want to skip ahead a minute or two and then continue on with the show. Number two, if you, and you know who you are, if you are in the league of extraordinary stupids with an S on your chest and a cape on your back, right now is the time to either shut the fuck up and continue listening before running to leave a review or just turn off the show. Two options for you too. Okay, I think that's fair. Yeah. All right. Yeah, good disclosure. Now, okay. with that being said, let's move on. So, the last time she used this, it convinced someone to kill a person. So, I think she figured she could use it again to convince a jury that her mother's telling the truth and they are the victims. She testified that Bob sexually abused her. She said that he had beaten and raped her starting when she was 12. She stated that she didn't tell anyone for years because she felt embarrassed and ashamed. And she also felt afraid that if she did, Bob and her mom would get a divorce. She testified that when she was 12, he began fondling her. According to her recollection, it all started with slapping. As she said, quote, I didn't feed the dogs correctly and he slapped me on my face and said, does this look good to you? Does this look like something you'd like to eat? End quote. She said that a week later he pushed her. In her own words, quote, I believe this time it was because I wasn't picking up the dog's bowel movement com correctly. He pushed me down and said, if you're not going to pick it up the right way, you can eat it. End quote. She also testified that on weekends when he'd been drinking, Bob would usually come into her room while she slept. She said that one time she was awoken by him pouring ice water over her head and then by lifting her up by her nightgown. Nicole stated that Bob raped her eight times between when she was 12 to 16 and then at 16 she left home. She said that she told her school counselor when she was in 10th grade, but she couldn't remember the counselor's name and there was also no record of it at the school. She also said that she only told her friends about the beatings, but not the molestation. But the friends didn't come out with that. Finally, she testified that Bob also beat her mother when he drank. In further testimony, she said that a year after her mom left Bob in October of 1988, she told Mary Ellen about the alleged sexual abuse. Nicole also disputed testimony by a lot of her former high school friends who said she'd asked them to find a gun and often talked about killing Bob. So she said, no, I never did that, even though a bunch of her friends said she did. She also denied that she had been involved in a scheme to, ki uh, to steal Bob's car and try to make the murder look like a carjacking. So the friends, again, a bunch of different people came and said that this is what she was trying to do. And she said, no, I didn't. And she denied that she told friends that she had missed, messed with the scene of the crime to make it look like a break-in and an altercation had happened. So basically, once again, just like her mom and everybody else in the story, she told a bunch of people what she did. And then when it came back to bite her, she said, I didn't say that. But it's a bunch of different people with the same story. So basically, mm. everyone is lying except her and her mother. The only problem with this testimony is that no one had any testimony that Bob drank or was a drunk. 
According to his sister, Susan Conroy, quote, I don't believe her. Bob wasn't that type of person. Like mother, like daughter. After all, she is fighting for her mother's life, end quote. Now, the trial lasted two months, and in the end, and like everyone else, the jury didn't believe Nicole. On July 1st, 1994, the jury found Mary Ellen guilty on two counts of first-degree murder. Due to the circumstances of the trial, they suggested the death penalty. Oh. Another two months later, on September 16th, 1994, the Superior Court Judge Michael R. Hoff followed their recommendation and sentenced her to death. Judge Hoff stated that the jury's guilty and death verdicts were, quote, clearly supported by the evidence, end quote, which he described as, quote, overwhelming, extensive, vivid, graphic, and most compelling. It clearly demonstrated the defendant planned the murders for a long time and had the ability to convince others to do her dirty work. The defendant involved many people, even her own teenage daughter and her daughter's friends, end quote. Mary Ellen was one of only 20 women on death row in the state of California. All of these death row women were held at Central California Women's Facility. But wait, there's more. On December 3rd, 2019, the U.S. District Court for the Central District of California reversed the death sentence on the ground that her trial lawyer had provided ineffective representation because he didn't object to the prosecution's admission of irrelevant evidence of her using, using drugs, selling drugs, and that she posed for cheesecake photos. According to the court, it said that the evidence probably wouldn't have affected the jury's de determination of a guilty verdict, but it had significant probability of affecting the vote of life or death. So, Mary Ellen is currently 75 and still in prison, but no longer on death row. Paul was paroled in 2009, but he was returned to custody in 2011 due to drug and alcohol abuse. Currently, Paul Gall or Daryl is currently they're not listed as prisoners. I couldn't find them. So I guess they're both out now. And before you ask, no charges were ever brought up against Nicole and she was never implicated in Bob's murder. And that is the story of Mary Ellen Samuels and Bob Sam Samuels. Because of how fast she went through her husband's money, which she spent $500,000. Now think about $500,000 back then. That's like millions now. It was a million. So she Definitely spent was a million. Yes. all that money in under a year because of that mm. she was labeled as the green widow so <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry that just i hate to laugh but that's the craziest thing i don't think i've ever heard that <laughs> that ter that term but it makes perfect sense it really does i was just gonna say a gold digger but they the call green her widow. the green widow wow mm. so mary ellen is still in prison Bob is dead. Jim is dead. Paul Gall and Daryl are out. Paul Gall, y'all, and Daryl are out. And nothing happened to Nicole or anyone else who helped in this crazy case. So what did y'all think about this? Did y'all believe Nicole? Tell us what you thought about this case. Let us know in the comments below. Or better yet, come on over to our Facebook fan page. You already know. Search Love and Murder fan page in Google or in Facebook and let us know what you think about this case. If you are an S on your chest subscriber and you come at me, I, I don't have patience for it. Just please keep your thoughts no, to yourself. No, I just know neither do and I. And the other people no, in the League no. of Extraordinary Stupids, y'all go and have your weekly mm -hmm. meeting and talk over there. Have a... Thank exactly. you. Leave us alone. But yeah, if you are an amazing LMNer, LMNer, <laughs> LMNer, <laughs> come on over to our Facebook fan page and let's all have a discussion. So, outro time. If you like this episode, go to Apple Podcasts or go to Stitcher, hit the purple button and give us, no, it's not Stitcher. What am I talking about? Go to Spotify. On Apple, you hit the purple button. On Spotify, you listen to the episode, and then there's a, like a button that says rate. So 
hit that button give us five stars say whatever you want in the description you could say this episode was long af which i know it was we're at an hour 35 an hour 30 but there was this was not an episode i could split in two i know you didn't want me to stop it like right in the middle of a sentence there was not an episode i could split in two and it was a crazy crazy episode so sorry about the length we'll try and keep it shorter but anyways you can say what you want in the description brings us up in the charts gets people to find us we would be ever so grateful to you thank you thank you thank you we love your reviews don't forget to visit us on patreon and become a subscriber for crazy bonus episodes uh, commercial free love and murder full episodes um behind the scenes just so much more come on over there it's an exclusive community it's even more exclusive than our fan group come on over join us it's only three dollars only three dollars a month i promise you and even when the price grows up everybody who join now they will stay at three dollars a month so join us over there you can follow us on social media at media at facebook.com forward slash relationship crime instagram at love murder podcast our facebook fan group like i keep saying love and murder fan page search facebook search google you'll find it or if you want some merch, go to our website, www.murderandlove.com. That's love and murder backwards, murderandlove.com. And in the menu, you'll see our shop. Just go there and you'll find all kind of merch, t-shirts, hoodies, glasses, everything like that. Or send us a page. Well, send you- Shar a page. I, <laughs> I, 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 I go by, I go by text messages and phone calls, subscribe. preferably text messages. Good Lord. <laughs> but anyway, you can also support us by free By basically just hitting that share button on this episode and sharing it out to your social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever, or sharing with your friends in their uh, WhatsApp, in your text messages, whatever. Share, share, share this episode. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this long, crazy episode by singing like a bird and reminding everybody that it's all all love and and no no murder, murder. y'all. Good night. Bye. Have a great week.